back to Spaced Out Radio's Cryptid Tales. My name is Amber Beckrude and today's wonderful story comes from right here in Canada. Well, it's probably one of our most well-known stories from back in 1967 and quite honestly, this was one of those places that Dave got really excited about when I said that I had to stop there on my way across the country last year. So I can actually say, I've been here. <laughs> um, this story is about the Falcon Lake UFO incident, which happened way back on May long weekend in 1967. And it's kind of one of the coolest stories that I have actually heard. Now, let's kind of jump back and give a little bit of the history behind all of it. So back in May of 1967, a man by the name of Stefan actually was out prospecting for gold and silver when he encountered something strange. While he was out in the middle of the area, he saw a spacecraft land somewhere in the woods. So naturally he thought he would go and check it out. Upon reaching the spacecraft, he found a, well, large spacecraft. It was a flying saucer type craft and when he approached the craft, he heard what sounded like muffled human voices and the sound of very loud mechanical engines. He went close enough to poke his head into the door of this spacecraft to which he said he saw a maze of lights. He was unstartled when the craft took off very abruptly and was injured by a beam of light that it seemed to shoot out of its body, uh, which caused his clothes to actually burn. And yes, I will throw pictures up on the screen because there are pictures of this incident. His clothes were burned, leaving a very strange pattern on his skin, which took some time to heal. This is also a piece of the story that he sweared up and down by until he died in 1999. So, what really happened in Falcon Lake? Nobody really knows for sure, but what they do know is that Falcon Lake has been one of the highest places in Canada for UFO activity and strange occurrences. Now, I have to say, when I was there last year, we only stopped long enough to let our dogs out to pee at the little beach resort there. Um, I'll pop up a couple of pictures of the dogs hanging out, but it did have quite an energized quality to the area. So it wouldn't really surprise me that there would be some strange goings on and um, maybe, just maybe, something a little weird. Now, of course, Going back, uh, we do actually have a drawing that Stefan did of this strange aircraft um, back in 1967. And of course, there was also some evidence that was later found in 1968, left behind from the area that he saw this spacecraft. So there was actually a piece of radioactive metal found in the area where he said he saw the craft in the first place. Now, this story has never changed. Um, he told the exact same story every single time up until his death. Now, of course, over time, yes, stories do change. They may change little details. It may change major details, depending on if it was fabricated or not. But because of the fact that those details didn't change over the years, it really adds the credibility to the fact that maybe this story is a real one. Who's to say that maybe there wasn't an actual spacecraft landing in Falcon Lake all the way back in 1967? Of course, unfortunately, I can't just stand here and ask Stefan if uh, he has any other answers to give to us, but it would have been interesting to actually sit down with him back then. So looking back at the original reports from Stefan um, when this incident actually happened, he was out prospecting near a quartz vein and he happened to see two cigar shaped aircrafts in the sky that he then got closer to after the geese took off and made a bunch of noise. 
thinking that maybe they were just a secret military aircraft exercise. So he spent the next half an hour, hour, doing what most wonderful people would do if they had a brain when they see these things, and that was sketching it. Of course, back then we had no cell phones that took pictures, so what do you do? Grab a piece of paper and start drawing it out. Of course, as he was around, he did recall how the air was much warmer around the aircraft, as well as the smell of sulfur, which to me is also a little fishy. He also recalled the sound of the whirling of the air around it and the sounds of the engines that were making quite a lot of noise, obviously a loud enough noise to drown out the sounds of whoever was talking inside. So as he approached this wonderful looking spacecraft, he yelled inside in English, asking if the Yankee boys needed any help, assuming that it was just a US military aircraft that maybe had some troubles. No answer. He then decided to try in Polish, Russian, and finally German, but still got no answer. So he then noticed and took note, as one would, that the aircraft was particularly smooth and didn't have any seams whatsoever. Probably an odd feat, considering most of the time you do need rivets to hold metal together. So who were these people who had very, very smooth spacecrafts? Of course, nowadays, sometimes we can actually mold metal and do those things so that it is seamless, but back in the 60s, maybe not so much. He then stated that as he tried to touch the aircraft, it was hot enough to the touch that it melted the ends of his gloves, therefore almost burning his fingers. And of course, like we know already, he didn't really make it away unscathed as he did end up with a completely burned chest and front of his shirt. This guy has balls, <laughs> I'm telling ya. I really don't know if I could have done all of these things, but kudos to him for being so inquisitive that he got up close and personal. He was turned into the hospital um, and treated for burns to his chest and torso and his stomach area, which later turned into welts and actually ended up scabbing over um, and took quite a while for them to heal. So all the more proof that something injured him. For weeks after he saw this spacecraft, he suffered from a number of symptoms like diarrhea, headaches, memory loss, and weight loss, as well as complete and total blackouts. Now, I don't know a lot about radioactive poisoning, but I can assume that maybe it would do some of those things, if not all of those things, but also, why would there be radioactive material here if it wasn't extraterrestrial? Of course, once all of this happened and stating that it was a unidentified flying object, his life got turned upside down, which, he, which his son does state in his book um, that he did write called When They Appeared, which I haven't read yet, but maybe if I can find it one day, I will. He did state that once they had all of these constant visitors all the time, it became really, really tiring. Frankly, I don't blame you, Stan. That is really tiring. I would not want to be in that position. And that also adds another layer of credibility to this story. He wasn't looking for the attention. And in fact, the attention seemed to be overwhelming. So why would you want to admit to something if it wasn't so serious? Falcon Lake has always been one of the most interesting stories to me because of how well documented it is. And obviously it is just as interesting to everybody else considering it was also covered on a episode of Unsolved Mysteries. And it's just one of the most talked about cases out there. So what really happened that night in 1967? And uh, where are they? Are they they really still coming down to see us? Is Falcon Lake still a hotspot? Is there something there that they want? 
who knows? And maybe we will never, ever know the answer, but it's good to have these questions, isn't it? So therein lies my question to you guys. Where do you think the aliens from Falcon Lake are after all of these years? Do you think that they are still coming back and that's why we do see our random sightings every now and again? Or have they just disappeared? And maybe we will never know what they wanted or if they got everything they needed. I for one had a very interesting experience there and even though I was just passing through I could definitely feel the charge of the area and you are definitely isolated and out in the middle of nowhere. Which is saying something because I lived in the middle of nowhere for so long that Manitoba, you're doing pretty good getting up there on that list. I would like to send a huge shout out to Ron Bumblefootthal for all of our music here on Spaced Out Radio. And of course, don't forget to join our Space Travelers Club and follow myself and Spaced Out Radio on all of our social media, which will be at the end of this video. And check out the other episodes of this season. We only have a few more weeks left before we end for the year. And uh, I'm excited. We still have a lot more UFOs to cover. And um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about the next ones coming up. So go ahead, drop a comment down below about what your favorite UFO story is what you think happened during that 1967 invasion, attack? I don't know what you would want to call it, on Falcon Lake. And always, always keep an eye on the sky and I will see you guys for the next one.